You know, when I think about death, I tend to think about how it's going to happen. Is it going to be painful? Is it going to be difficult? Is it going to be long? Is it going to be quick? Am I going to just die in my sleep? So I spend a lot of time thinking about it, but it doesn't, it doesn't scare me. After looking back at my life, it really was a very good life. And I would love another 25 years of it, but I can't complain for what I've had so far. I've known Michael Becker since I started covering biotech 18 years ago. Mike is part of a big trend that is affecting cancer in the U.S. People who are experts, who've lived and breathed this industry, and are now having to deal with illness themselves. What attracted you to working in healthcare? When I was a financial advisor, I thought, what better industry to invest in than pharmaceutical and biotech? You have the opportunity to make a client money to help their kids go to school or buy a new home, and the investment is going towards you know, curing and diagnosing new, new diseases. And I thought, that's got to be the best thing in the world. And then I became the CEO of a biotech company, and I said, well, that's the best thing in the world because now I'm actually influencing the development and, and treatment um, of, of various diseases. So being a CEO was, was clearly the best out of the, uh, the various careers that I've been fortunate to have been a part of. Head and neck cancer used to mean you were kind of an older man who smoked and drank a lot. Now we're seeing a lot of guys who look like you who are still pretty young. And tell me a bit about finding that lump and, and what happened. You know, it was the most bizarre experience for me because of my familiarity with biotechnology and cancer specifically. I walked into the bathroom one morning, glanced in the mirror, and there was this big bulge on the right side of my neck. And it wasn't there the day prior. Uh, it wasn't sore to the touch, it wasn't warm, nothing that would indicate an infection or anything that would normally go through your mind. And that's what really scared me. A couple days transpired, no change whatsoever. They did a biopsy, and um, that's the, uh, my lungs had lit up like a Christmas tree. This HPV story started to kind of roll out at the beginning of the last decade. When patients walk in through that door, the majority of them I see now are all HPV related. If it's just HPV related, we cure the vast majority of patients. That's assuming that the tumor is limited above the collarbones. In my situation, he got treated with curative intent, and then you know, a little less than a year later, on the follow-up imaging, was found to have the spread. I'm pretty sure that the thought bubble that goes off on my oncologist's head when I walk in the door is, Okay, here comes Michael. He's a blogger. He's the guy that's going to write the details of whatever I say and whatever this appointment is and whatever the outcome and next treatment is. So I got to watch what I say. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure that I'm probably a handful to manage as a patient. Knowing the statistics, knowing you know what's really going to happen, um, I monitor each of the tumors that they measure and have an Excel spreadsheet and stuff like that. So in that regard, it's probably a negative and I should probably, uh, you know, just enjoy life and stop uh, uh, focusing on it, but uh, it's hard. Now, you, you were telling me before you were making a, uh, a pretty big decision here. This is probably going to be your last cycle of chemotherapy. What's, what's, tell me about that. What's, what's leading into that? that decision. Yeah, I've been beat up a lot. Um, the, the first line therapy was just brutal. Um, you get to a point where you start to wonder you know, why you're doing this and you know having bought a lot more time than I thought I would have had uh, initially but at this point I have to ask myself you know how much more punishment do you really want to endure for an outcome that's unlikely to change one way or the other. You have to ask yourself how many times you're willing to step in front of that bus and, and go through that. And so how's been dealing with that with your family, Ben? I mean, with your wife and your daughters? My daughters have both taken the, we're going to ignore it, we're going to pretend it's not there, and you know, uh, that's their coping mechanism. But I think about 
every waking moment uh, about not being there for their uh, wedding, not being there for the birth of their child or children, not seeing what career they ultimately uh, end up doing, um, and just not, you know, just not being there. I, I think in the beginning I was scared for what it was going to do to me, how it was going to die, you know, was it going to be painful, was I going to you know, literally drown in my own lung fluid, there were a thousand different disaster scenarios that went through my mind. And I very quickly came to realize that it's much, much harder on the people that are around me. So I try to cry alone. I try to cry when they're not home and shelter them from, you know, what, what's going on. One thing that I wanted to do was to actually, to have made a difference as the CEO of a biotech company. And I've had plenty of positive experiences with launching drugs or in licensing something, but to have an impact on that and change not one person's lives, but thousands. There are CEOs that very rightly so can sit back and go, I made a truly tangible impact on this patient population. And I, I, I miss uh, not, not having that claim to fame.